live from Orlando, Florida. Extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering Pentaho World 2015. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. So congratulations on the high energy and, and covering a lot of ground. Um, how do you feel? I feel great. Um, I'm really happy to be here for a second year in a row. Uh, last year was their first one, as you pointed out. A lot of energy, uh, both developer energy, but also business energy. So it's a great combo. So you made, um, you set up sort of the spectrum of different types of analytics, and I want to talk a little bit about them. But before we get into that, uh, what do you see in your customer base. You know, Forrester does a great job dealing with both business technology and technologists. What are you seeing in terms of uh, analytics in general, uh, its ability to affect business outcomes? You know, everybody talk, you, you made a sort of a tongue in cheek about data is the new oil. It's the same. Sun is the better analogy. Is data analytics changing the businesses in your client base the way that everybody expected well, I, it to? I, the way to explore the answer to that First, starting with the business priority. So our survey data shows that the number one business prior priority is customer experience. And that's, you know, the reasons are obvious. Customers pay you, you want the loyalty, you want to get new customers. So that's sort of the backdrop that drives analytics and data. So companies want to know, what can I do? How can I monetize this data? And this is one of improved customer experience, more personalized customer experience. And when the term big data, So, some businesses saw this opportunity and said, okay, we can, you know, we're already in the data business. We can now accelerate, um, you know, time to insights, or we can make that data more readily available to our, to our customers. In other situations, you have customers that they don't really understand, you know, how to make a data-driven organization. They're confused. They're, um, they're trying to figure out new business models. And George, we've, we've seen this as, as well when we talk to practitioners. How do they go about monetizing data? What are you seeing in that regard? Well, there's a lot of questions there, but um, you know, the first one is data-driven, what it means to be data-driven. There's many organizations that I think, they think that they're data-driven, but they're actually human-driven, and then they use data to prove they're right. So if you think about traditional analytics and reports, who decides what's on that report? People. So they decide, I want to see this, I want to see this. And it's usually to confirm what their belief is about how the business is working, what KPIs matter, what matters. So a lot of the data-driven business intelligence actually is not data-driven. It's human-driven with data supporting it. So for an organization to become truly data-driven, they have to actually use the data to find answers and not to confirm their own biases. So you had the spectrum of different types of analytics from descriptive yeah. all the way to, to prescriptive and a couple in between. Um, one's looking back, sort of the... Well, there's a couple in between, yeah. but they're very important. Yeah, so let's talk about yeah, those. So there's, so there's descriptive, which the best way to think about that is traditional business intelligence. It's reports, it's dashboards, it's profit and What happened? Yeah, right, what happened? It's always based upon the historical data. The second one, and these aren't necessarily in, in order, but is predictive analytics, okay, building a predictive model. So think of uh, a risk score. You know, your, your credit score is a predictive model. A customer's uh, likelihood to buy a product is a predictive model. A recommendation is. Uh, like, uh, I recommend that you might like better call soft, right? A recommendation engine is predictable, so predictive analytics. The third one is screening analytics, which is real-time, 
computer that's detecting what's happening in real time and analytics on what's happening. And then finally, it's prescriptive analytics, which is what should you do in the moment? What's the next best action you can take? One of those four analytics is very distinct, and there's a very distinct set of technologies. They all ultimately need to work together. Um, but, but there's very distinct technologies. And it seems like prescriptive, yeah. being able to actually take action, turn, turn insights into action, seems to be the one that organizations are, as I said, great potential, but as a consumer, I feel as though it's the one that has sort of the biggest challenge associated with it. And I don't know if you would uh, agree with that or what you know, data shows. I mean, you had some excellent survey data. You guys do a big survey each year. I think you had, one of the surveys you did was, I want to say, over 3,000 global yeah, yeah. individuals, yeah. Uh, practitioners and business technology practitioners. Obviously, a lot of business people too, because you know, Forrester has those in a big constituency. And then you had a number of smaller surveys. So I'm wondering, what are you seeing in terms of that fourth category, that prescriptive analytics? Is that really nirvana, or is it actually happening today? Prescriptive analytics kind of struggles to be understood onto what it is because it's actually three things. Um, it's business rules, so it's what you do about something, right? I now know, so for example, the Obama campaign uh, famously used predictive and prescriptive analytics in the 2012 campaign, right? So you want a predictive model to predict who a swing voter is, and then you want a prescriptive model of what to do to influence that voter. So do I talk about healthcare? Do I knock on their door? Do I call them up? Do I send them an email? Do I send them a letter? What, is, what, is, what action for that individual is most likely to influence them? Now, how you implement prescriptive analytics, you can do it in three ways. You can do it with business rules, which is basically a human saying, all right, if these factors, then do this. You can use it with a second predictive model, like predicting based upon these factors, I should knock on this person's door and talk about education. That's the most likely thing to influence them. And then finally, there are some numerical methods using linear algebra to figure out what to do as well. So, so the prescriptive category is, is, is the hardest to understand, and it's the least understood. So the Obama campaign is a good example. We've had some folks on theCUBE before from you know, the Obama campaign, yeah. and, and those are kind of early days yeah. of, of big data. One of the practitioners in the Obama camp just raised $58 million. I don't know if you saw that, but. Uh, really? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yes. I'm, I, I wonder how many of the presidential candidates now are sort of using these forms of analytics. Well, right, right. I mean, you wonder yeah. if it's like Moneyball and they all get it and sort of hop yeah. on. Yeah, they hop on. Yeah. And then if they're like the Red Sox, they, they break the, the pattern because somehow they won three, three World Series and they figure, <laughs> oh, yeah. we'll try something different. Yeah. Okay, but uh, right, I mean, it takes discipline, yeah. doesn't it? And it, it does, and, and I think there also has to be a realization that it's not a silver bullet either. Right, it's, you know, yeah. prediction is about probabilities. You're not, you know, uh, it, it can't work miracles, but it can give you an edge. Just like, you know, at the casino, if you have, you know, the casino has a one, two percent edge, they can build those tall, fancy buildings. Um, so sometimes you don't need much to just give you an edge. So, were you at Strata two weeks ago? Or no, I wasn't. World? So, a couple big themes there. One was sort of this data in motion, move to real time. There was a lot of talk about storage, obviously. Kudu with you know, yep. database and, and complexity. Uh, George and I are interested in your thoughts on, on Spark. George, you're enthused, you know, you're excited about the, what's going on with, with Databricks and sort of the next gen platform. Well, and we, we were talking about this, just, you know, it's not as mature and hardened um, as the Hadoop ecosystem, right. but that it is more cohesive and easier to run as a service, it appears that as we go from sort of a, a service-rich offering early in the market to more mainstream product-rich product uh, for customers who don't have all those fancy skill sets, mm -hmm. it would seem like Spark is going to have an, an important role to play as a compute framework mm -hmm. within the Hadoop ecosystem. Is yeah, yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, you know, most people will say, and I would agree with this, that Spark has, has taken over for MapReduce on Hadoop. Right. Now that doesn't mean that it's taken over for Hadoop. Right. Hadoop adds, I mean, you know, we can, we can chat for a long time and all the additional value propositions, but Spark essentially, um, there's two things about it that, that, of why it's taken over MapReduce. Uh, one, it's got an in-memory model. 
But the second is the DAG engine, which is a directed acyclic graph. It's a, it's a, it's a way to parallelize work, and it's an easier programming model for developers. Um, so while you still need to be a programmer to, to really use Spark, if you are a programmer, it's easier to use that programming model than the MapReduce, and it's faster to And be. they're actually putting layers on top of it whether it's you know taking a Python notebook, which is yeah. notoriously it's kind of single processor, yeah. spread it across the cluster, or those or these other interactive notebooks. Yeah, I mean you gotta you gotta be you gotta be careful of that because like there's also Spark R, yeah. right? And that there's you know there's Python notebooks, but you can't take any arbitrary programming language, whether it's functional or whether it's object oriented any arbitrary program that you and I, we could just sit here and start writing some code and then just magically say, I want to distribute this, right? So, so that's where people got in trouble with R. They thought that you could just distribute a program. You can't, it, so what they've done with in Python. R, but with, right. is, can you not right. do that with R now? Or? Well, what they've done is yeah. they said, all right, well, if, if, if you have an R script and now you want to run this logistical regression algorithm, call this function, that function will then call out to a parallelized implementation of it. So, right. so I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to make sure that, that people understood that it's 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 not a perfect parallelization. But but let's back up yeah. just a bit because we've gotten down in the weeds. Yeah. Um, in the interest of sort of looking at this class of applications that we're that we're aspiring to with Hadoop, mm -hmm. you know, beyond the data lake to get to predictive or prescriptive, yeah. um, how much easier will it start to get when we have Spark as sort of the core compute framework and then all the sort of administration and governance capabilities surrounding it from the Hadoop ecosystem? Yeah, no, I think that's a great point that you make that, that that's one of the values that Hadoop is bringing. Right. right? The, the governance, the security model, the, the resource management, and, and you know, Spark was designed to run on Yarn. So I think it, I think it will get easier, um, but we also need high level, we still need higher level tools on, on top of Spark. It can't just be, it has to be a programming model, but it can't just be a programming model. So we're tight on time here, Mike, I apologize for that, but I want to get your take on Pentaho, Pentaho World, this is a second year keynoting. Yeah. So you spend your time down here, so obviously you like what's going on, yeah. but what's your take on how they're doing um, it's interesting, they're 11 years old, Hadoop's 10 years old. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Hitachi acquisition real quick, but what's your take on Pentaho, how they're doing, sort of where they fit? Number one, open source. You know, and I think sometimes people forget that Pentaho is actually from the open source community, right? Because I, I think people in the community, that just, that's just a given. But I think people being introduced to Pentaho might not always realize that. So, open source innovation model. Um, Pentaho is often difficult to understand from a newcomer because they actually have multiple products, right? They have the data integration pro uh, product and they also have the analytics, that, you know, the, the front end development as it's well. It's a visualization. And a visualization yeah. thing, right? So, so, you know, the idea in the past, these things are, have really been like separate markets. Like you'd get this and then you get this, right? They sort of had the vision to, to put those together, and I think that the market is, is, is catching up with the idea that the data processing and the analytics has to be closer, and the, and the visualization has to be closer together. So I think they're in a uh, good position there. You mentioned the Hitachi acquisition, which, which is new. Um, that certainly gives them uh, you know, uh, tremendous resources that, that Hitachi can bring to bear uh, globally. Um, uh, especially, I think, in the industrial uh, IoT and many of the initiatives that Hitachi has and just, I think they call it, don't they call it social innovation? Social innovation, yeah. So, social innovation applications, I mean, on, yeah. on paper, you got $80 billion diversified business. It yeah. looks like a, a huge potential win to yeah. put Pentaho in there. Now, yeah. how they go to market, we have an Hitachi Yeah, I mean, I think it's too new to really, you know, this, this, you know, there's lots of things that happen in any acquisition, right? Yeah. The, the, they have you know, that, that have to play out, so. Um, uh, but I think, I think you're right. I think on paper it looks great. Yeah. All right, sorry, we're out of time. We've got to leave it there, Mike. All thanks right. very much for coming on theCUBE. Uh, great job today, and it was really a pleasure having you on. All right, thank you. All right, keep right yep. there, buddy. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live.
from Pentaho World 2015. Right back. Live from Orlando, Florida. Extracting the signal from the noise.